Thank you, sir. It does not go unnoticed. Good morning, Family Church. Thank you. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, as you can tell, I'm still a little stuffy. Um, so I apologize for any drainage or coughing, uh, but you don't start a series called Committed and not be committed to coming up and preaching it. <clears throat> so I knew it was coming last week, and then uh, I pretty much almost couldn't get out of bed until like Wednesday. Um, and that's just because my wife was making fun of me too much, so eventually I had to do something about it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, if this is your first time with us, I'm Jared Cochran. I'm Pastor Phillip's uh, youngest, more handsome son, the associate pastor here. Uh, if it's your first time with us, a um, couple warnings. I'll probably yell at some point. It's not out of anger. It's out of passion. Please know my heart. I'm not angry with people. Um, have a really bad face that looks angry, but I promise on the inside is the joy of the Lord. Uh, we are in week three, episode three of a series called Committed out of Second Chronicles. We started this obviously three weeks ago in chapter 17 where we're walking kind of through the life of Jehoshaphat. Uh, and if you're about to have a baby, uh, I told them lock the doors by the way so you guys can't leave. You'll have to give birth in here. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. You guys start the timer. Um, and uh, yeah, so we learned about the life of Jehoshaphat. He is the fourth king in Judah. Uh, if you know the nation of Israel, it was split in, I think it was 930 BC into the northern and the southern kingdoms. The northern was the 10 tribes out of the 12. They split off. They had uh, different beliefs and pretty much it just boiled down to they went into full-blown apostasy and rejecting God. Uh, the southern nation, Judah, was just two of the tribes. They somewhat tried to follow God, but as we all know, as men and women, we fall short because of our sinful nature, but they, they tried. Uh, and so we've been walking through this. We saw in chapter 17 that Jehoshaphat set his face to the Lord. He devoted himself to the Lord. The, the first week was called Renewal, about renewing uh, our call and, and the urgency for the, the time that we are in and the way that the world is and the way that the country is and just the reality that, you know, we hear it so often that we're in the last days and the truth obviously is that ever since Jesus ascended, it has been the last days and the Bible is full of prophecy, some of which still has yet to be fulfilled and there's some of it that just recently got fulfilled. So we are truly in the last days. So when I say I'm passionate and I'm yelling, it's because there's this burning in my soul of the urgency for the need to uh, reach the lost. Um, I know, as is often the case with a lot of churches, uh, we see it's almost like this weird competition that, you know, we want everybody to come in our church, but not, you know, go to someone else's church. I, I, I reject that. I'm about collaboration, not competition. Uh, we're all on this. We should I'll be on the same team, obviously, uh, and we'll learn about a little bit this today. There's some not so good people that have slipped in and uh, either slipped into the church or started their own church, very loosely using that term, um, and they're just false prophets, but there's an urgency to reach the lost. We, we are running out of time, so that is, that is my heart, uh, and we see that chapter 17, he set his face to the Lord, the Lord established the kingdom. And then in chapter 18, last week we started, and I only got like halfway through, but I got nowhere where I wanted to go, of course, <coughs> because uh, I prepare entirely too much, and um, you know, <laughs> I prepare just way too much to bring to you guys, because, <laughs> what is that? Are we going to a wedding? Um, you guys, there's 100, was 168 hours in a week? Um, this is the only day usually that churches come together. Some people do midweek. We do not. We do a uh, online only for you all, live with either my dad or my wife, Kelsey. Uh, we sit on the couch. It's called the family room. And we break down this message. Or sometimes we get completely off topic or we just dive deeper into what is here Sunday. Um, and it's just important that you continue to feed yourself throughout the week because... 
we're just this, the, the world itself is starving for truth. I said this last week, and it's just a shame that we go 168 hours or whatever throughout the week, and then we want to come to church and just get a 20-minute sermon. Uh, that's just not enough for me. Um, I don't know why, and I'm not trying to use this as a highlight to say, oh, I'm going to go for two or three hours today. Uh, I know I keep making promises. Uh, again, next week is the year mark of my first sermon here. So I'm still working this out. So I know you're probably sometimes, some of you not excited about the length, but I am trying to figure it out, um, trying to sound, you know, happier and things like that. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of hell in the world, and I can't help but be real and raw with you um, because that's all you're going to get out there. Except without there, it's it, out there. It's deception, and uh, in here, it's devotion to God's word. Um, this week, I plan on <laughs> just uh, kind of finishing up. <coughs> excuse me, chapter eighteen. Uh, if we can stand for the word of God, please. I'm just going to read a few verses, and then we'll sit down and we'll jump into it. Second Chronicles eighteen for you note takers. Um, I'm going to start in verse 9, which is kind of almost where we ended last week, but I just want to refresh your brain on it a little bit. So it says, dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria. With all the prophets, as if you remember last week, these are 400 false prophets, uh, all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Kanana, Kanana, sorry, <clears throat> still got a little brain fog, had made iron horns, and he declared, this is what the Lord said, false, uh, with these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. Now pay attention to the wording here, verse 11, all the other prophets were prophesying the same thing, attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the word of the Lord will give it into the king's hand. And the Holy Spirit reminds me, uh, the land is God's land. Um, it's not our land. This land is not your land, not my land. It is God's land. You'll give it into the king's hand. Verse 12, the messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, <laughs> look, the other prophets without exception are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. Please, dear preacher, be nice and humble everyone's little ears. But verse 11, but Micah said, as surely as the Lord lives, mm -mm, I can tell him only what my God says. Woo. This week, we're committed, uh, yeah, we're, we're committed to continuing committed, and uh, this week, I'm going to speak on rejection. Rejection. Has anybody ever dealt with rejection? Perfect. This is probably not going to be the rejection that you're thinking. <laughs> Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we, not, that we do not take lightly to be able to gather in your house here freely. Because we know that our brothers and sisters in Christ in other parts of the world right now have to hide. We know, we God, I, I pray that you strengthen those in North Korea that if they are, when they are found either just speaking the gospel or even reading the Bible, they can serve at least 15 years in an intense labor camp, God. So in America, God, humble our hearts, convict us, God, and let us truly seek your word and just stop taking it for granted what we think is just a, a, week, a weekend ritual, like a weekend warrior, God. I pray that you strengthen our hearts, guide our minds, renew our minds. I feel you. God, we thank you for being here. We thank you that we have you just have you to worship, to praise, and to love. God, I am your vessel. Speak through me. Let nothing that comes out of this word return void. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> amen. 
So, as you know, as I said last week, Jehoshaphat sets his heart out, and he gets uh, blessed, and all of the uh, opposing nations, they have the fear of the Lord falls on them as he sends preachers and teachers out into the world to teach the Bible, uh, the book of the law, which would have only been what they had in uh, the first five books, essentially, because none of that yet. Um, <coughs> Oh, this is going to be fun. So he sends them out and he gets blessed. God is, is able to, uh, God establishes his kingdom. He brings him wealth. He brings him gifts. He props him up, makes him stronger, makes the nation stronger. We know that he gathered over a million soldiers. And after that, right after that in chapter 18, a few years pass and the honeymoon stage is over. And like so often uh, that we find ourselves in, we start out on fire for God, and then we kind of relapse and become a little bit more lackadaisical and a little bit more complacent instead of being content and pushing further into the word of God and further into the truth of God. And he, he makes an alliance with Ahab, who was the evil king of the north at the time. Uh, his wife was Jezebel, just a very terrible woman, very terrible person. She's the one that brought in the uh, pagan rituals, and they had like the... Uh, child sacrifices and religious sex cults and, and prostitution and things like that. And that brought about just the downfall of the north. And because of this alliance with Jehoshaphat, his son is the one that married Jezebel's and Ahab's daughter. And because of that alliance, that brings the, down, the eventual downfall of Judah. But today on rejection, on the, word, the importance of the word of God, I want to point you towards <clears throat> verse 11, like last week, where all the prophets are saying the same thing. And I made the joke that there's no way that anyone is ever going to be in a large group, especially 400 people. I mean, I've got a house of five, and they can't agree on what to watch on TV most mornings. Uh, you know, even, even between your, your girlfriend or your wife or your husband or whatever, there's always some type of disagreement. So the fact that all of them are agreeing on this one thing and they're lying to Ahab saying, if you go here, you will be victorious. Uh, they're pretty much just paid off to tell him what he wants to hear, which is a problem we see too often now uh, in, I hesitate to say, the Christian church. I hesitate to say churches. We are, we are the church. Uh, it's not a building, if, if you understand that. It is each and every one of us. You are the church. You have a platform. You have a platform. You have a voice. You have a Bible app on your phone. You have social media. The time has never <coughs> been easier to proclaim and preach the word of God than it is right now. I cannot imagine just what, what Paul and Timothy and, and Silas and Matthew and Mark and James, like what could they have done with this technology that we have now? I mean, whew. but, and eventually, uh, never mind, that has nothing to do with today. Let's keep it going. So they're all prophesying the same thing because they're being paid to tell him what he wants to hear. And we see this so often in churches now where you go somewhere and they tell you exactly what you want to hear. Um, sometimes what I say is not what you want to hear, but it is what you need to hear because I am not going to stand before God on judgment day with your blood on my hands because I did not warn you about something. You can hate me for it now and thank me for it in the clouds, but I, I will not have you look at me and tell me that I did not warn you and did not tell you of the reality of the situation that we are living in. If you were in here with our team talk, you know we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. You can see it now more than ever. You turn on anything. Look at any music video now, how dark it is. You saw Sam Smith at whatever you know video award thing that was. I mean, why do we got to dress up like a devil and have... You know, a bunch of half-naked women dancing around us with horns. You see the imagery. Look at all of the images online, on just everywhere of magazines and videos and movies with the, the one hand over the eye. They put it in front of your faces. But we're so desensitized because we're just used to it. <clears throat> like, um, <coughs> excuse me. Like, no, maybe. 
Just, yeah, just toss me one. I'll break my coat today. Good Lord. <laughs> ah, good. I don't have a table, so that's going to be awkward. Um, you see it with like these, uh, like the, the, the LGBTQ parades and all these things. You go to it. And they're wearing almost nothing and putting it in front of kids' faces because for some reason it's somehow not child abuse to bring these things, to bring kids to these things. And uh, I mean, I was talking to Kelsey about it the other day that it, it's almost like, what's the difference between that and just walking around in lingerie? And they're putting it in front of your face. And a lot of people, when I see it on, online on comments, they're like, oh, you, you know what? What's the big deal? They're not like, you know, having sex in front of everyone's face. Okay, the problem why that is accepted now is because we said something else wasn't a big deal and we came here. So give it about 10 to 15 more years and they will be having sex in front of your face out in the open. <laughs> but verse 12, the messenger who goes, they're, they're all prophesying the same thing. And the messenger who goes to Micaiah, oh, the, the wording here, without exception, everyone, there's no disagreement above, uh, uh, among them, without exception, they are predicting success. And I'll get into this later, but write this down if you're taking notes. Prophets don't predict. They do not predict. We'll get into that later. Just keep it in your back pocket. But a prophet, he speaks God's truth. He doesn't just see the future, he speaks the future. That's how you know it's a true prophet of God because they don't just speak it, it comes into existence. It comes to fruition. If somebody comes up and says something that they're a prophet of God and they tell you something and it can be not just refuted by scripture but it also just never comes to pass, that is a false prophet. That's what these people are, the 400 prophets that Ahab is paying off to tell him, go to war because he wants this land. And he's already done something like this before when he coveted Naboth's um, <coughs> vineyard and he went and had a, a little cry session in his bedroom and made his wife go kill him. So without exception, they're all saying the same things. And look at the temptation here. Let your word, he's telling him, the prophet Micaiah, and this is one of the prophets that Jehoshaphat sent out, <coughs> oh man, in 17. I'll just carry it. I don't, I already hate this. This drives me nuts, drinking water in front of y'all. But it's bad, but I'm committed. <coughs> Micaiah was one of the prophets that was sent out in verse, uh, ch chapter 17, excuse me. And this other guy now is telling him, look, let your word agree with what they're saying. All the other ones are saying all of this good stuff. They're predicting all of this nice stuff. All, you know, he's gonna win. They're all saying he's gonna win. Just let, let your word agree with it. And that's the temptation we have so much in our society, especially now, as Christians, go with the crowd. I don't like coming to your church because the pastor says too much about the stuff that I'm doing in the dark, and I'm not ready to really get rid of that yet. I don't want to get rid of my sexual immorality yet. I don't want to stop sleeping with my, my boyfriend yet. I don't want to stop doing drugs yet. I don't want to stop getting drunk every night yet. And you know what? No judgment. Jesus will work it out through you. If you're here and you're not a believer, you belong before you believe. And sanctification is a lifelong process. You don't just come to Jesus. For some people, yes, they can come to Jesus and everything's just gone. The desires are gone. The temptations are gone. But for those of us who are a little bit more real and might have been stuck in the world a little bit longer, it's a little bit stronger and it's tough to get rid of those things. But that's why in your prayer life, you go to God and he, you ask him to wring that sin out of your life. God, <coughs> I felt lustful this week. Wring that sin out of me. I felt temptation. I felt just sickness. I felt bitterness. I felt depression. I felt angry, God. Wring that out of me. I felt judgmental. Pull that sin out of me and make me more righteous, Jesus. And that's the thing with Christianity. We've got to get to the place where it's just not, we're not judging people on different levels because I've been walking with God for 15 years and you've been here five days, but I'm expecting you to be living exactly like I'm living. That's not how it works. <clears throat> you might have more biblical knowledge, but it has to connect here. 
I guarantee you there's way more people in this audience right now that knows a lot more about this book. And that's fine. Use it. Use it. So we see this with the temptation, compromise. Let your word agree with what they say. Don't preach that stuff. Start preaching the good stuff. Start talking about how God can bless me. Start talking about God, how God can pay my bills. Start talking about how God can, can, can <clears throat> give me a new car, give me a new house. Start talking about how God can change my husband. Don't preach the truth. I know you like that Jesus stuff. But if you, if you want to get promoted at this job, don't start praying in front of everybody at lunch. I know you like that Jesus stuff, but do you have to post about it every day? I know you like that Jesus stuff, but I mean, is it really like a fire in your bones? Do you really have to try to shove it down my throat all the time? I know you like that Jesus stuff, but don't talk about it. Let your word agree with what they say. Go with the crowd. Everybody's saying this stuff. You should start saying this stuff too. Don't preach the cold, hard truth. If you can twist the gospel a little bit, we can get more people in the seats. We can get the bills paid a little bit better. But I'm not trying to fill seats. I'm trying to feed souls. I'm trying to get Jesus to free souls. Oh, and the temptation to just back up a little bit and don't preach the truth as hard. But you see Micaiah in verse 13. Oof. As surely as the Lord says, I can only do what my God says. They've all been preaching what their God says. They've all been telling you what you want to hear. They've all been saying what the false gods want to say. But me, I know as long as God is alive, I can only say what God has told me to say. I can only preach the word that's coming out of this book. I can only preach from the Holy Spirit that flows through me and leads me. I can only say what God says. And the sad thing is, he knows walking into this, he's going to be rejected. Just like I know standing here, I will be rejected. And when you go out into the world, you will be rejected. They will reject you. Your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your kids, they will reject the truth. Do you stop? Amen. No. No. Continue to speak it over them because telling the truth will bring tribulation. And when you start standing on the word of God, hell will start pushing back. And it will make you feel crushed. It will make you feel alone. It will make you feel like no one is in your corner. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So if God is with you and God is for you, you are already the majority. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That's not somebody with a gun in your face. That's the demons coming against you, telling you, shut up. Don't post that. Don't talk about that. Don't speak about that. Do you really believe that? Do you think they're going to believe that? Your father's dealt with alcoholism for 60 years. You think he's going to change just because you're preaching to him now? prisoners of war. The, 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 the reality is they, they reject him. They reject his word. They reject what he's saying because he is a true prophet of the word of, the word of God, of the Lord. And we know, I mean, oh, iniquity, iniquity, sin. Iniquity is always going to reject integrity. You can post whatever you want. You can post about how much you go and party. You can post about how much you go and drink, how much you go and smoke, how much you, you go and snort, who all you're sleeping with. Whatever you want to post about, you can post about it. But the minute you start having a little bit of integrity in your life and standing up for that and standing up for God and standing up on moral values, you will be rejected. You will be rejected. Your family members will reject you. They overseas, they kill people for it. Fathers kill their kids. Kids kill their fathers. But we come in here, and I don't mean this to sound crushing, but we come in here and we just we don't we don't have that going on here. So our brain doesn't connect with it. And to us, it's just it's just coming in on Sunday and hoping we stick to a time limit. But there is there is power in standing up 
for God. There is power in standing on the word of God. This is why you need to keep it on your lips day and night. This is why you need to bury your face in it to listen to it. Turn off your music and just start letting you version play every day when you're driving. That doesn't mean you can't listen to music entirely, but start soaking this up and saturating it more in your life than any other thing and see what God will change in your life. See what it is. See what it is. Be obedient, committed, being obedient to God, staying committed to being obedient to God. This does not, like I said, this, this does not mean you're going to be protected. I know we want to. We want to, <laughs> I love the Second Amendment, you know, come knock on my door and I will arrange the meeting with Jesus type of attitude. <clears throat> but obedience doesn't mean, obedience doesn't mean you're going to be protected from it. It provokes it. The minute you start being obedient to God, you will provoke the attacks of hell. The minute you start being obedient, it provokes oppression. It invites it. It invites it into your life. And this is where we kind of, I, uh, hmm, I don't really want to say hey, separate the wheat from the chaff, but I mean, kind of. You either, you've either got the courage to be obedient, or you've got the cowardice to compromise. That's heavy, but that's truth. You, you, you've got to have courage to be obedient. The minute I started this series, it's just been hell for weeks, and I've been sick, just slowly getting worse, and thank God, I'm finally on the men's. But you see it, the minute you start preaching and speaking hard truth, biblically-based truth, hell is knocking on your door, ready to kick your teeth in. And the only thing you can do is stand up with the fire of the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead within you and kick hell right back in the mouth. The minute you start being obedient, you are inviting oppression. But the glory of the Lord, oh, the glory of God is that the minute you do it and it invites it in, God insulates you from it. Micaiah gets thrown, he gets slapped in the face, much like Jesus gets slapped in the face, and thrown in prison. Thrown in prison just because he speaks God's word. He gives them the whole thing and tells them, you're going to fail. He tells them why it's gonna happen, and I'll get there in a minute. But he gets thrown into prison because of this. He's not protected from it. We actually... I'm sure he's vindicated because Ahab does die, but there's no mention of him after this. So we don't know. But even if he did die, we know that because he stood for God, he is standing in heaven today. God will insulate you from it. This is why you see, if you go online and you look at these street preachers, my favorite one I watch all the time is this kid, well, he's probably my age, Nicholas Bowling. Uh, like well, maybe college age, and he goes to the belly of the beast, the LGBTQ stuff, the gay pride parade, all of that, and just preaches the love of Jesus, the need to repent, Amen. truth. He preaches truth, and it's not hateful. Right. He's never yelling. He never raises his voice, <clears throat> but he preaches the truth in the belly of the, de- uh, the beast, and you can see demons literally just manifesting in people and just standing there and screaming at him and spitting at him and trying to break his equipment. There's one where there's literally cops watching the entire thing happen, and I don't know the law too well, but I'm pretty sure you can't just go tamper with someone else's property. But they walk up and they break it and try to smash it, and he goes over to them three times and makes a complaint. And they do nothing. Well, we're working for the bank, you know, uh, uh, just standoffish. No courage. Zero. You're supposed to stand up for the law, but they're taking the side of evil trying to not pick a side. You're either going to stand up for God or you're not. I I don't know how to say it. You're either going to do it or you're not. And if you deny him before men, he will deny you before his father. So he gets thrown in prison. And, but the, the, the good thing is that he's obviously in heaven now because it is, it is better to be obedient and face oppression from man. It is better to be obedient and face rejection from man than to be weak 
in your faith, to be woke in your faith, to be watered down in your faith and face God's wrath. It is so much better to stand up and not fear man than to stand in front of the Lord and go, I, I, I was just too worried. One can kill your mortal body. One is in charge of your eternal soul. I don't know which one you want to be scared of more, but I'm definitely going to be more scared of Jesus in charge of my (coughs) soul. And he tells them how this is going to happen. And I won't read everything, but he talks about how he sees a vision of a throne room, an area in heaven, and God is asking, who is going to go entice Ahab? And this is weird and difficult to grasp, but it says that A, verse 22, A, deceiving spirit. I'll read uh, 21. He says, I will go and be A, deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. This is not God being a liar. This is not God telling someone to go lie. This is God initiating a test to see how you will respond, how you will react, if you will accept him or you will reject him. (coughs) And he says, you will succeed. And verse 22 says, now, so now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths. Are you catching the words? In the mouths of all his prophets. All of them, the Lord has decreed disaster on you. It only took one to get all of this done. This is one, a deceiving spirit in the mouths of 400 prophets. One to get this done. The Bible tells us that one third of the angels fell from heaven with Satan. If one could do this kind of damage with 400 people, How many is a third of heaven? Turn on your TV, go on the internet, look at how much censorship is coming through, what is it, X now, and Facebook, and YouTube, and TikTok. How much deception is just directly invited into our face that most of us, because we're not truly reading this and we don't know the word and we don't test the word, we watch a reel on TikTok and we're like, oh, that makes sense, yeah. And then that leads us down a path that ultimately takes us completely off of focusing on Jesus. One, one done, one and done. One gets 400 mouths and there's a third of the angels of heaven. And that sounds dark, but you can see just how much deception is in the world and it sounds dark and it sounds like we're outnumbered, but obviously two thirds of the angels are still in heaven. And even if all of them went down and all of them rejected God, he still created them, he still created us and he is stronger than anything, anything that can come against you. So even if all of hell was coming against you. God is still within you, inside of you, strengthening you, fighting for you, and moving you, and lifting you out, and delivering you. Oh. And then Zedekiah, one of the false prophets, comes up, smacks him in the mouth. Lucky it wasn't me. We've been throwing down, (laughs) rolling around. But he comes up and he rejects it. And basically what I see that this boils down to is Zedekiah is more concerned with his position and Micaiah is more concerned with the piety of God. Zedekiah wants his position. He's getting paid to say these things. But Micaiah has been provided for by God, provided by God to come here and speak the truth to him. And what's funny is that he first says it sarcastically to go along with the other false prophets. But Ahab, which is hilarious that it's Ahab, since it's Ahab, and he's like, how many times do I got to tell you to tell me the truth? He knew. He knew. He, and, and, and still, after this, he knew that Micaiah was lying, essentially, about doing it. He's like, tell me the truth. And Micaiah's like, you do that, you're going to die. And guess what? They still go and do it. 
they still go to war. They reject the word of the Lord and they still go to war. And Ahab gets killed. And somebody will probably tear this apart on the internet, but, and I have looked up tremendously, but the Bible says that he was hit between the breastplate and the scale armor. And I've tried to look it up, so there's this whole piece. So the only way it's coming through is by the side. And what that screams to me as I read it and read it and wondered and looked it up is that the arrow must have pierced somewhere near his heart. So you can disguise yourself in any way that you want to, but God still judges your heart. I think God was judging Abraham and saying, your heart is dead. And it slips in. And because of, y'all go home and read this. That, oh, I, I don't even, I can't get into all of that. But he's such a coward that he wants to disguise himself as not a king and tells Jehoshaphat, you still wear your robe. And, and Jehoshaphat's like, all right, cool, good idea. Like, dude, what? Are you serious? Like, now you're just a target. And they literally, the opposing army, it says the, 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 the opposing army, they're told only go after Ahab. So they go looking for the king. And they go after Jehoshaphat. I'm getting ahead of myself. We're gonna have to come back. I'll come back, I'll come back. The, the, the prophets rejecting the word of the Lord. It's hard to stand in front of you and know my heart and, and some of you don't know my heart. And you think I'm just screaming at you and I'm angry. I'm just saying all this mean stuff, but you have to understand my heart is, is, is burden free. I'll, it just in a moment of transparency, there was a day, and I spoke to you about this earlier this week, there was a day when I probably wouldn't have cared as much what you were doing. And there was a day when I wouldn't have cared as much when people were mocking God openly, because now it's just accepted and celebrated. And I wouldn't have cared. But I, I told you at the start, I've asked God to break me and change me and shape me, and now I have such a burden for people. And I watch, I watch these, in here and online, I watch these people stand up and it's just pleading. You don't know what's just the truth of it, and I get it, we believe it, but we just don't understand the severity of it. And we watch just God be openly mocked and and rejected, and Christians are just like, ah, I'll just go over here where, you know, there's another group of Christians because it's fun over here, and we're just watching these people be condemned to hell and doing nothing about it. My heart burns for these people. My heart burns for you. You have to understand my heart. I'm not trying to shout at you. It's just a passion. God just burns within me, and there's a moment when the Holy Spirit fills me, Amen. and it's just, it just takes off, but it's just openly rejected, and we're, and we're stuck in this rejection thing. And, and I told you, <clears throat> gosh, I hate that. In verse 12, just, they're, without exception, they're predicting success. Predicting. The prophets don't predict. Predicting to me is pretending. Right. Pretending. A prophet foretells the future. It will happen. It's going to happen. God said it will happen, it will happen. If God said it's going to happen and it doesn't happen, that's because God didn't say it. And the thing is, prophets don't predict, prophets don't pretend. Just because you have a position with a title can mean you have power. You can be in a position that has power. But just because you are in that position doesn't mean you have any power. That is why we have a bunch of pastors right now that are nothing more than pretenders and they're just predators standing there like wolves leading the sheep away from the gospel and the truth that is Jesus Christ. And we're watering it down and we're putting rainbow flags on our churches and we're putting rainbow robes on making a mockery of our king. I saw it this week. There was some stupid 
universalist thing or something like that that got posted online. And the logo is literally just rainbow. And it's a shame now that the symbol of God's promise, the colors, the rainbow that it surrounds Jesus' throne. What we would love as Christians, we, we just, it's now just disturbing to us because we know now Satan has hijacked it. And every time we see it, we know what it is and how unfortunate that is. That we have let something as simple as that slip through our hands and become enemy territory. Outside of the Ark uh, exhibit in Kentucky, I'm pretty sure there's a big rainbow arch. I remember seeing a picture of it. I was like, whoa, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, you idiot. There was literally a rainbow there. But just where your brain goes because of how desensitized we are now to it. Because we expect it to mean something with the LGBTQ thing. But we have these pastors, these pretenders that come in and they start these churches that's completely just a mockery of God, completely rejecting the word of God, pretending, leading people away with with bad doctrine, false theology, no biblical knowledge, or just enough that you can sprinkle in some truth and lead people astray. And people celebrate it. Where can I find an affirming church? Where can I find an affirming church? Where's someone that will accept my brokenness and then want me to stay in it? Want you to stay in it. And we see the twisting of the truth in that, oh, Jesus loves everybody. Yes. Jesus accepts everybody, yes. That doesn't mean you get to stay that way. That was never Jesus' intention. I see this stuff all the time online. Oh, Jesus just invited people in and just accepted them. No, he always told them, go and sin no more. Where in that do you see, hey, it's okay that you're living in sin. It's okay that you're living with your girlfriend or your boyfriend. It's okay that you're sleeping right before you get to church. It's okay that you're living in open mockery. It's okay that you're living in abomination that is homosexuality. It's okay with that. Do you see any of that in there? No. No. And people, oh, well, where did Jesus say something against? And this wasn't even supposed to be my sermon, but obviously the Holy Spirit is speaking something. I'm watching. I got 20 minutes, 19 minutes. They're like, Jesus didn't, where did Jesus say something about homosexuality? Jesus himself said, a man shall leave his father for, and mother for a woman. A woman. A woman. A man and a woman. And that's one of each in the relationship. Don't twist it and say, well, okay, it's a man and a woman, but we got two or three that we're dealing with, bouncing around like ping pong. I don't know. (laughs) But the, the revelation I got this week about rejection, and I know so many of you thought and I'll, you know what, I'll speak a minute on it because we think of rejection. We don't like, I don't like rejection. I go to give Kelsey a hug. My love language is physical touch. I'm, be nice. Uh, my love language is physical touch. I have a very hot, beautiful wife. I like her a lot. Uh, hers is, um, no, I know what it is, but I'm drawing a bl- uh, uh, acts of service. There we go. I knew what it was. I just couldn't remember the name. So, you know. The acts of service. So, (laughs) and you you see the reel where like, I don't know if any of you have seen it. I sent it to you this week where the mom has a counter of how many times kids say mom each day. And it's like over a thousand by the time she goes to bed. So I get it. And it's like, you know, once you're overstimulated, then I'm like, ah, how are you? And then, you know, you get the rejected. And then you want to go sulk in the corner like Ahab. (laughs) But... We see that with rejection. Nobody really wants to be rejected. We want to be loved. There's something within us that wants to be loved. And I'm not a super emotional person. I took, never mind, I won't share that. Um, Yeah. (laughs) I'm like a robot. Um, But there's something within us that wants to be loved. We don't want to be rejected. 
And what's sad is that how that rejection manifests within our life. And I think that's why we see so many of, and I'm not trying to pick on the women today, but the half-naked girls on TikTok and Instagram and I guess OnlyFans, I've never been on there, but where you're just stripping out for everybody because you've been rejected so many times that you're needing so much external validation. Like the guys with all these gym videos. Oh, you shouldn't curl like this. You should do it like this. Like, okay, as if we don't know. There's like nine million influencers to the gym as if we don't know how to work out by now. But I think, and I, and I think, and I don't know if this is just me, but we keep rejecting God and his word and what he wants for us because we want to bring him down to our level. We keep expecting and wanting to minimize God and act like God needs something from us. God doesn't need anything. He is God. He's already made what he wants to, wants to make. He doesn't have a need. If, he, if you think he needs something from you, he's no longer God. God doesn't need anything. He desires your love. He desires your worship. He desires your praise. And not only that, he is worthy of your devotion. He is worthy of your praise. He is worthy of your worship. To him be all the glory. But we take it off because we don't want to believe in the higher power. We don't want to believe in God. We want something down on our level. And I think the reality of it is that we deal with this rejection of of man and rejection ultimately of God and his word because we resent ourselves. There's a deep-seated resentment about something within us. Nobody... I would wager, is completely happy with every part of who they are. And if you say I'm lying, come up here and pray when we get done at the altar because I guarantee if we have a long enough conversation, we can find something that you don't like about yourself. Whether it's your teeth, your bad breath, how tall you are, how short you are, how skinny, how much hair you have or don't have. We can find something that you don't like. And when you deal with it long enough, it becomes resentment. And then ultimately, that resentment begins manifesting itself into other ways, and it leads to rejection. We resent ourselves, so we reject God because we think it's, oh, just a book with a bunch of rules instead of being about the relationship. God is not just about rules. He's wanting us to change. He's wanting us to live a holy and a separate lifestyle so that we don't end up in eternal damnation, so that he keeps us from things that are waging war against our soul, waging war against our bodies, and wanting us to live in complete harmony with him. But we live with this resentment for so long, it's like an extra limb. And you can get surgery to have it removed. But we reject the surgery because we don't know what we would do without it. I've lived with it for so long, I don't know how I'm supposed to live without it. And I don't want to cut it off. I don't want to cut it off. It's been here for so long, I've I've grown used to it. I'm content with it. I'm complacent with it. Whatever you want to say, I've just grown accustomed to it. I'm used to the pain. I'm used to this. I don't need to go any deeper. So I don't want to cut it off. But the reality is, if we don't cut it off, It's cutting us off from our calling because we're clinging to it. We're clinging to something that God wants to rip off, to cut off. Think about the vine. You have to cut off those bad branches so it will grow into what it needs to be. But ultimately, we live in a time where people are just rejecting God's voice. In 2 Timothy 4, This won't be on the screen, but I highlighted it this morning in this Bible. In uh, chapter 3, verse 16, how all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We like the teaching part. We don't like the rebuking part. I don't want to be corrected. Training, okay, maybe on Monday through Friday, and I drank my amino acids and BCAAs and take some protein powder. 
Oh, you mean training my soul for warfare so that when the weapons are waged against me, they won't prosper. That kind of training. Oh, that's right. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. But chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. I give you this charge. I give you this charge. Preach the word. Stop. Preach the word. 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 You have a platform. You have a voice. Why am I shouting? Until y'all start doing that part, I won't say it anymore. Be <laughs> be prepared in season and out of season. How are you prepared? Just leave it up for me, please. How are you prepared for an attack if you only start training when the attack is there? How are you prepared for someone to break into your home if they kick the door and you're like, hold on, I got to run down to the store and get a firearm, please. I'll be right back. (laughs) In season and out of season. And I don't know about you, but I would wager it's always in season. And I'm not trying to like ooh, rip the Bible apart, but I would say we're always in season. You always need to be ready. You always need to be prepared. That's what it means in and out. When life is up, when life is down, when life is good, when life is bad, when God is blessing you, when God is removing things away, be prepared. Amen. <laughs> I thought of Lion King <laughs> with my ADD brain. <clears throat> oh. Be prepared. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of seven season. Correct. Rebuke. There it is again. And encourage with great patience. Amen. That hurts me. With great patience. I don't have patience. Mm-mm. He's working on it. <laughs> Pray for patience and God makes you a pastor. Uh, Oh, Lord, help us. With great patience and careful instruction. Careful instruction. Heed heed these words. Be prepared. But have patience when you correct someone. Have patience when you rebuke someone. Have patience when you encourage someone. You can do this. Don't just leave it at that and back away. And then have patience when they can't do it yet. And continue to encourage them. When the young 33-year-old pastor says he will keep it to an hour, and then it goes an hour and a half, and an hour and 50 minutes, but he's trying to keep the time limit down, but God has a word to speak, give him great patience. (laughs) I like that one, Jesus. Thanks for that. For the time, this was the main verse I wanted to get to here. For the time, why are you texting me? For the time, I gotta get away from that. From, <laughs> for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Just let that sit. The time will come now, always. When people will not put up with sound doctrine. (laughs) Is it that the time is too long or the word is too challenging? Where's your priorities? Uh, Does anybody know how long eternity is? A A long time. What's the saying that if a bird flew from here to the moon with one grain of sand... From Earth, and when it finally removed all of the sand from Earth to the moon, if we could break through the firmament. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's, for, that's for some certain people. <laughs> if the bird could remove every grain of sand individually and fly to the moon, when all of the sand was removed, I can't even fathom how long that would take. Eternity has just begun. Eternity has just begun. But man, our butts get sore after 45 minutes. And I'm ready to go. But the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. They don't want to hear the truth about God. They don't want to hear the truth that challenges them. And it challenges me. And it challenges you. They don't want to hear truth that cuts like a double-edged sword. Because it needs to strip the sin off of my life. And make me more righteous. The time will come when people don't want to hear that. Instead, to suit their own... What word is that? Desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers and a uh, number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. What their ears want to hear. There's so many false prophets right now preaching what people's ears want to to hear so many preaching what people want to hear what they want to hear not what they need to hear I don't want to preach what you want to hear I said I would be nicer but I, I'm going to say this part I don't care if you leave here and say, well, that wasn't for me today. I don't agree with that today. Good. Because it's going to agree with you later. Because right now you might be rejecting me because we reject God's voice simply because we don't like the vessel that is bringing it to you. We don't like if a pastor's not in a suit and tie and he's in a t-shirt with a $20 Etsy necklace and some tattoos. I want my pastor to be buttoned up, to look good. Even though Jesus didn't have a three-piece suit made of Gucci or Armani with croc skin things on his feet. He didn't have a tie. He had some sandals. And he let a woman with an issue of blood touch his garment and be healed. He preached against the people that brought a naked woman into the temple. Do I care what I dress like? No. Should you? No. What you should care about is the content of the character that is standing before you. The content of the sermon that is coming out of the word of God. That's what should burn within your soul. Not your judgmental preferences. You should be caring more about is this true or is it telling me what I want to hear and I feel good but it's leading me into hell. That's what we should care about. Is it truth? Is it truth? I heard this this morning in Matthew 10. Verse 16 to 25. I won't read it. But Jesus is talking about how He's sending the apostles out to go and preach the word. And we are all charged to do this, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15. Go look it up. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's not just my job to make disciples. It is also your job. You can reach way more people than I can reach. <laughs> but Matthew 10 these are the disciples, the apostles. They have a title. And Jesus says, I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Like sheep. I am stripping you of your title. Because we are all sheep. And you are going out among wolves. And he tells how persecution is going to come. How rejection is going to come. And the first thing that he mentions where rejection comes from is religious people. Religious people, those within the body of Christ that are just here as plants from the devil to strip us and cause division, to cause distraction, to cause 
discontent and discord. Those that want to come in and slip in and create agitation and confusion to separate the body and cause a church to split and break up. But he says, stand firm and be saved. Stand firm and be saved. You will be hated just because you follow Jesus. You will be hated because you speak Jesus' name. How much more when you begin to proclaim it over things, to proclaim it over your situation, to proclaim it over the sickness in your body, to proclaim it over the addiction in your body, to proclaim it over the, the, oh my gosh, the lustful desires and the sinful desires and the temptations and the bitterness and the depression. How much more will hell come against you when you truly grasp the reality of the strength of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is within you? And hell wants to wipe you out. But if you stand firm to the end, you will be saved. You will be saved. In Luke 15, verses 18 to 20, Jesus gives, well, not just those verses, Luke 15. Jesus gives the parable of the prodigal son. I preached a sermon on this, I don't know when, last year, this year. Uh, Don't miss the party. Don't miss the party. And if you've grown up or been in church for any length of time, I'm sure you've heard the story of the prodigal son, the younger brother, Asks for his inheritance essentially, which I can't dive into all this without time. Culturally, it was a disgrace to his father to ask for this stuff. He's basically saying, I wish you were dead, give me what's mine, and I'm running away. He goes off, discovers everything to do, runs to Las Vegas and has sex with everybody that he can have sex with, takes all the drugs that he can take, takes all the alcohol that he can take, and squanders his entire life away. And when he finally hits rock bottom, he says, I I, I gotta get back to where I was. This wasn't wasn't what I thought it would be. And you know the story, he goes back and the older brother rejects the father and the party because I've always been here. That's the religious folk, the Pharisees. I've always been here. I've always been doing good. Why should he get it? Why should he get to come back in? That story, we make it so often about the prodigal, the son running away and coming back. The the reality is that story was more geared towards the elder brother, towards the Pharisees, saying he's accepted because he realized his sin and repented and came back to me. You're still far away because you don't realize how unloving you are. You think you're doing good just by your righteous rituals and trying to please me. And in another part of the Bible, God reminds us that he desires mercy, not sacrifice. Not sacrifice. But the son, he runs away and it's only when he is in a pig pen literally in a pig pen, which is an unclean animal for their culture. He should not be in there. And he's eating the food that they eat. The pods. He's eating what pigs eat just to try to survive. And he goes and runs through this entire speech trying to get back to his father, thinking his father's gonna reject him, thinking, if I can just be a servant for you, I'll work back all of the debt that you gave me. And the Bible tells us, as he's practicing his speech, the father sees him a long way off and goes running running towards the sun. That's 
that's a disgrace in their culture that a man would run like that. It dis he disgraced himself to go run towards the son that is returning to him. But we get caught up in wanting to give people programs and all this stuff when they come to Jesus and make sure they're hitting level one, two, two, you know, one to three and four and five. And if you read Leviticus, you'll get extra points. And we want to give a scale to God. He's like, I just want you to come back into my arms. And he, he goes running after the sun. And today, all I want you to realize, all I want you to realize is when you stop rejecting God, when you stop rejecting his word, when you stop rejecting a vessel that is God is using for his voice to speak to you, when you stop rejecting all of these things and you return to him, you will realize that he has always been running after you. He's always running after you. What would be humiliating for him to leave eternal glory, to leave a throne and come down and live like one of us in the dirt and in the grime to be broken and mocked and spit on, rejected by his family, by those in his hometown, by those he came to save. And as they're nailing him to the cross, as I said it last week or whenever, Father, forgive them. They're literally beating him and killing him and nailing him to a cross and he's still interceding for them. Still praying for them. Father, they don't know. These people don't know. They're just rejecting you. And I think it's because of the resentment we have with something within us. But when you stop running and you stop rejecting, God is right there already running towards you with his arms wide open to bring you back into the kingdom where you belong. Turn the lights down. This morning, I told you I'll keep the time down. We've been praying for revival and we sing about revival and at times it seems we beg for revival and we need it. This church needs it. We collectively, individually, each of us needs a revival, a re-ignition of the fire of God within your hearts, the baptism of the Holy Spirit within you. Healing. We need revival and we pray for it. But when it comes looking like something else, why do we reject it? We're expecting something, we are expectors. And when the expected shows up, if it doesn't match the description we put in our minds and our heads, we reject it. There were those that expected Jesus to be like a military savior that would overthrow the Romans. That's what they expected. And when he didn't come as they thought, they rejected him. But those that truly sought the relationship with their Lord and with their God and dug their heads into the book and studied it and knew it and let it saturate their soul, they knew he was a spiritual savior. And that's what we needed all along. And they were the ones that knew. And you're the ones that know. You're the ones that realize he didn't come here to overthrow a government. He came to establish his kingdom. And you're a part of it. You're a part of it. 
and he wants you to be a part of it. But we have to stop rejecting him. We have to stop. We have to stop rejecting him. We have to stop rejecting his word, the people he uses, the people that he chooses because of the ideas of how we expect church should look, how we expect church should go, how we expect someone should be. God doesn't call the qualified. Finish it. He qualifies. That's why I told you to finish it because I know I was going to stutter. He qualifies the call. God doesn't reject you. You reject him. He doesn't reject us. He's not the one that ever breaks his covenant with us. We always break it with him. And we slip and we fall. And if we're not careful and we don't repent and we don't return, game over. But the reality is, it's not too late. And if you're here this morning, you're here for a reason, you're here by appointment, this word was meant for you at this time to understand the need to stop rejecting the word, to stop rejecting your calling, to stop rejecting what God wants you to do, to stop rejecting God and just dive in and know him, understand him, love him, and seek him. He is chasing you. He is running after you. And his love never fails. Let's all stand. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Please. <clears throat> A good father cares for his children and loves his children and with that love comes correction correction is love I don't know who needs to hear that today but correction is love the most hateful thing you can do to somebody is not correct them, to not warn them. And the most loving thing you can do is correct them in love, in understanding, in patience, in wisdom. God is refining this church. And with that refining, with that fire, it burns. Fire burns. It ignites a flame within you that cannot be quenched, that cannot be contained, and the gospel will pour out of you the more you let it pour into you and the way that you get more poor is by your pull the more you pull on God the more you pull on the Holy Spirit the more you pull from the word the more you can pour out into someone else the more you can pour out and share the blessing in the gospel of Jesus Christ but if you're not pulling you're not getting poured into and you can't pour out fire burns it will ignite within you a passion for God. But the other side of it is it will burn off things that do not need to be within you. It will burn off the impurities. And in some unfortunate cases, those with hard hearts, they will be burned off from the body. And I pray for those today. God, I pray, I intercede for those who leave. Those 
that are part of the branches that get trimmed off, God. That are pruned by you for the benefit of the whole body. I pray for those branches, God, that there is still time to find repentance before judgment comes. And I pray, God, those that would leave continue to follow you and be blessed. Father, we ask for grace. We ask for mercy, for patience, for love and understanding. As we are refined in your fire for the revival that is coming, God, burn the impurities off of us and strengthen us. Make us like sparkling gold in your eyes so we can proclaim your glory, so we can see your glory, so we can experience your glory, so we can share your glory, so we can proclaim your glory, so we can lead others to your glory, so we can strip back the enemy's gates and take back humans from the territory that is in Satan's kingdom, all for your glory, God. In the name of Jesus, mm, I rebuke every spirit of division, every spirit of discontent, every spirit of negativity, every spirit of discord, everything coming against this church, I cast down in the name of Jesus. Whoa! Hell cannot come against this church. It cannot come within this church. Any demons that are latched onto a human body cannot step foot through the front doors of this building. And I pray not only are they delivered, but they are healed in Jesus' name and they are filled with the Holy Spirit because they can be delivered, but unless they are refilled, with your spirit they will return sevenfold or more and I cast that down in Jesus name help us wage war God help us stop rejecting you ring us out Ring us out, Heavenly Father. Ring out the sin. Ring out the impurities. Help us wage this war that we are called to do because we are your soldiers. I come against the evil that is infiltrating this nation. Every office, not just locally or regionally, Nationally, I pray against it spiritually. Reignite your people for you, God. Reignite this nation. Lord, send revival. Flood us, God. And equip us and anoint us to do this task. We are more than conquerors. Help us remember that. Help us realize that. Help us apply that. Help us live by that. Help us truly accept that. We are more than conquerors. That means you're already a conqueror. Help us get back to conquering. God, protect these people. Protect your flock. Lord, sin revival. Lord, sin revival. Amen. Amen. They're going to sing, Lord, sin revival. <laughs> Last week, I, I gave that charge, I think, to worship.
I don't know where any of that, well, I know where it was from, but we, we need, we need, we need revival. And with that comes problems. With that comes op- opposition. There's both opportunities, but there is opposition. But we need the revival. Because when we endure to the end, when we stand firm in the faith, we will be saved. Now is not the time to be silent. (coughs) Now is not the time to give up. Now is not the time to stay in Jesus' diapers. It's the time to grow up to gird up your loins, to pick up your sling, to hit the giant in the forehead and go grab their sword and cut their heads off with it. I'm not calling for violence. I'm calling for spiritual warfare and the church to realize the authority that is within you, the authority that is within you, the authority that is behind you, in front of you, all around you. Take back what is God's. We're going to sing one more song in worship. If you need prayer, come to the front. (coughs) I'll pray with you. Somebody will pray with you. If you don't know who Jesus is and you want to know, come find me over there. I will tell him or tell you. But let's just worship one more time. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.